Well, today is the last day. I am so glad that you've been in my classroom this week, but you know what the last day means? Test. We couldn't have a classroom without a final test. So, we'll have a little bit of a warm-up, but here's what we're going to do for our test today. All right? As quickly as possible, find out if your seat is an odd number or an even number. The number should be right on the back. If your number is missing, look at your neighbor's number. All right. Here we go. Can you hear me okay? No? Okay. Very good. So here's what we're going to do. The odd numbers, okay, listen carefully, odd numbers, we're going to go over the words first. So, so we're going to go odd, even, odd. And the order is hope, riches, power. Got it? So odd are going to start on the word hope. Here we go, odd numbers, on the count of three. One, two, three. All right, now we're going to switch it around. The, uh, the even numbers are going to start with the word hope. On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Hope, riches, power. Okay, now we're going to add the questions in. Now we're going to add the questions in. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to do two rounds. First round, odd-numbered folks, you're going to be asking the questions. The even-numbered folks are going to be giving the answers. And then I'll pause and reset the classroom, and then we'll let the, and then we'll switch roles. Ready for the test? Ready or not, here we come. All right. Uh, here we go. Um, odd number, are you ready? On the count of three, you're going to ask the question, right? Get it in your mind. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah, uh, not bad, not bad. Let's see if the uh, even-numbered folks can outdo them, all right? Okay, um, even-numbered folks are going to start this time. On the count of three, you know the first question? Are you ready? One, two, three. Much better. Would the odd-numbered folks like a chance to uh, outdo them? Or actually, the even-numbered folks. So we're going to do it one more time. All right, odd-numbered folks, you're going to ask the question. Even-numbered folks, see if you can uh, do a little bit better than they did. All right, here we go. Odd-numbered folks, get ready with question number one. It is one, two, three. Give yourselves a hand. Are you able to turn my uh, computer on? Thank you. You know, when I was a pastor, I would tell my catechism students, there are no quizzes or tests in my class. And the first day of the class, they would look at each other because they heard how hard Pastor Onimus' classes were. And then I would explain to them, God will send you the tests in your life. I only give you faith-building exercises. They look a lot like tests and a lot like quizzes, but God gives you the test. So... Um, that was my test this morning, and uh, I need to identify as a child of God. 
Before we get it up, here's the next slide, right? The, the next slide is the top of your bookmark, right? Session number one, I asked you to be praying for three things, that God would open your eyes to be able to see more clearly what your hope is in Christ, namely you're a child of God, what your riches are, namely that you are, have a glorious inheritance, and then finally, what is the immeasurable power, right? It is unmeasurable. It can't be measured. That's what we've been praying for. So part of the test this morning is for you to simply reflect what is it that you have learned this week? We began this week praying. And even if you did not keep praying through the week, I know many of us were praying not only for myself but for you, you young people. And what is it that you have gained? What has God shown you this week? What has God opened your minds to? And if you happen to be taking notes, maybe put a bullet point or two of something that has really stuck out in your mind and to say, you know what? At the beginning of this week, I didn't really know what to expect, but now God has opened my mind to this. And at the beginning of this session, what I want to do is to begin once again with prayer. Asking that God would show us what we otherwise cannot see unless we have the power of the Spirit working in us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come humbly before you. In the songs that we have sung this morning, we have admitted that we have no power in ourselves. We have no mental abilities that would enable us to see the invisible. But Father, today we once again come to you in the name of our blessed Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And we pray that you would open our, our minds so that we would understand what the text of Scripture is saying. That you would so soften our hearts so that when we hear that word, we would receive it and we would drink it in and take it in like a sponge and we would love what we hear. And by the time that we are done here, Heavenly Father, may the words that we look at this morning from your word, may we feel energized to follow through and to obey and to do so not in terms of a list of do's and don'ts and duties, but rather a sense of privilege to live as your children. Father, hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let me just do a quick review with you. On day two, we had noticed uh, Brother uh, Sean had told, talked to us about how God had raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at the uh, right hand of God the Father. And he gave us the analogy, both of uh, a surgery that he had had where there was a, a blocker. Also, there was the, uh, the, the fire extinguishing system that had never been hooked up in order to point out to us our need to be connected to Christ. On Wednesday, we heard about intruders that were on campus and was very unnerving to us. Those intruders are still present, right? Apart from God's grace, we are dead in Satan's kingdom. Yesterday, we came to finally, but God. But God. He raises the dead and enables us to do what we otherwise would not be able to do. And now, this morning, we come to a second but, and that is, but God seats believers. I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, please. Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to be looking specifically at verses 6, especially the second half of 6 to the uh, end of verse 10, but I want to back up to begin reading at verse 4. Hear God's word and receive it with a believing heart. But God, 
being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There ends the reading of God's word. May he also add his blessing to it. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10 this morning, and I'm going to give you a very similar outline that Pastor Sean gave us on Tuesday, where he talked about the power and the purpose and the pattern, and now I'm going to connect that with good works. And the reason I'm using the same outline that he used on Tuesday is because there is a direct parallel between Jesus Christ and what we learned about him on Tuesday and what our passage is now showing us uh, today on our last day. There is a parallel between Christ and the believer. And so notice, we have Christ on our left and believers on the right. Back in uh, chapter 1 in verse 20, we learned a number of things about Jesus, and now we come to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 to learn something about uh, the believer. What we learned about Christ back in 1 verse 20 is that there was the power by which God the Father raised him from the dead. Physically, Jesus was in the tomb. His body was there for three days, and on the third day, he was raised up again, his resurrection. Notice what we find in verse 6 of chapter 2. It speaks about how God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. And that's not only a physical uh, resurrection, it's first and foremost a spiritual resurrection whereby we now have new eyes to be able to see. We have new feelings in our heart whereby we desire something new, something different. And there is now a, an energy in our will where we want to and are enabled to begin to obey the word of God. Going back to Christ in chapter 1. It also says that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. Now, look at this. What about the believer? Also seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Notice, one is a position of power... Uh, Pastor Sean on Tuesday described that as simply raw power, strength, the ability to act. But the second one has to do with a position, a position of authority. Having worked in the prison system, this analogy has come to my mind and it goes like this. Some of you have heard it before, but it goes like this. I talk to my students and I say, now, after you've served your time and the day comes where you go out the front gate... And the warden comes running after you and says, come back, come back. They get this big grin on their face and say, I'm not turning around, I'm not doing anything. I'm moving forward. In fact, um, I say to them, what happens if the warden says, if you don't come back right now, I'm going to write you up because write-ups always somehow make things worse for them. And they say, I'm going to keep going. And the reason that they're able to do so is because they have fulfilled the demands of the law of the state. And therefore, what they can say to the warden is, Warden, you have no legal claim on my life. You have no right to hold me in your prison. Because my sentence has been fulfilled, I've done my time, I have satisfied the law of the state. Do you see how that analogy carries over to the believer? 
when we are entering into temptation, what we can say at that very moment to ourselves and to the devil to say, you have no legal claim on my life. I do not belong to you anymore. I belong to Jesus Christ. It is his righteousness and he has fulfilled the law on my behalf. And therefore I am free. That's the idea of having a position seated with Christ. You can use that authority. In the name of Jesus Christ, I no longer have to follow the desires and the temptations of sin because I am free. And we might want to remember that at times even when we're in a group of friends and the friends say, hey, let's go watch this movie. And you say, no, I can't. Not only that, I won't. Why? Because I'm seated with Christ. And I have the authority to no longer have to do that. Do you see how we have the power, the position, that gives us the legal right to say, I don't have to do that. And then I take it a little bit further with my, my students. I say, and then what happens on the day that you're about to leave... How many of y'all are going to go past the chow hall and see if you can get their recipes so that you can fix the same meals that they have here when you get back home? And that always brings a big groan because I eat with them. I know they have these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I think the way they make them is they put the peanut butter and the jam or whatever it is and they stir it all together in a big pot. This is just my hunch because of the way it turns out. And they take two slices of bread and I think they take an ice cream scooper, thunk, put the other piece on because you've got this big glob in the middle and if you don't kind of smush it out and push it to the edges before you eat it, when you get to the middle it's like, ugh. And they say, of course we're not going to eat those sandwiches. And then I say to them, on your way out, how many of you, as soon as you get out, you're going to go over to Walmart and find yourself a nice khaki outfit like you're wearing here? And they say, no, I never want to see khaki again. Do you see what that is for the Christian? By the power of Jesus Christ, we have been set free. And if we have been set free, why would we want to go dine at Satan's dinner table? Why would we want to put on the clothing of Satan and his ways? We want to live as new people. And we can begin to do so because of the power of being raised to life and also now the power of being and the position of being seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. Notice this in verses 8 and 9. Because unlike the inmate, we can never do enough time, can we? So how do we get this? Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So that when we get to heaven and we come through the gates... And we look at one another and say, how did you get here? Well, let me tell you, I was the main speaker at the 2023 RYS convention. How else do you think I got here? You and I are going to look at each other and we are going to say, I got here by the blood of Jesus Christ. My place in God's family is a gift to me. And we have been saying to each other this week, I'm a child of God. How did you get that status? It's a gift. God gave that to me. 
It doesn't come from speaking and preaching. It doesn't come from going to church after so many times that you finally get your blue ribbon. No, it's a gift. And that means, young people, if you find yourselves having any interest in the things of God, say to yourself, God has given me a gift. When our children were born, we named them very deliberately and purposefully. And I turned their names into a catechism, so above each one of their beds, they have a little catechism. And the first question is, what is your name? And it states their name. And then it says, why are you called Anima? And the answer is, because by God's fatherly hand, he placed me in this family. I think too often we consider that I happen to be a Christian or I happen to have these convictions because I happen to have grown up in a Christian family. Well, let me say to you that there are millions of people every day who are not born into Christian families and it is no accident that you were born into the family that you were born into. Now, that in itself does not make you a Christian, but it gives you tremendous privileges and wonderful opportunities to learn about the things of God. And God uses what has seemed to be so normal, ordinary in your life that you have heard these things perhaps most of your life. God uses that to bring you to himself. And so don't recognize the grace of God. Don't fail to recognize and be ignorant of the grace of God in the ordinary daily things of your life. It is a gift of God so that none of us can boast. In my first session, I told you about J.D., You remember he had been in prison for 20 years. He had been out for 20 years. During those 20 years, he had built up a trucking business. He had gotten married. He started breeding dogs. And I think I left the story off that he felt hopeless because he had lost his business. His wife was divorcing him, and she had just killed his favorite dog. About six weeks later, I came to the floor. There's an elevator that takes you up. The elevator opens, and you enter into a cage and you wait for the officer to come and let you out. And so the officer lets me out, and guess who is uh, waiting there? J.D. J.D. says to me, Ken, I need to settle this thing with God. How do I do that? I said, I tell you what, you meet me after class today, and we'll sit down and talk about it. And so we went through the day, and it finally got to, I don't know, it was probably about 5 or 6 o'clock. That's when I probably finished that day and uh, found J.D., and we went to the back classroom, and we sat down, and I simply explained to him once again what the problem was, that we are dead in sin, what Jesus did in order to cover our sin and to make us alive, and then to say to him, this is what Jesus did for you and your sin. Is this what you believe? Yes. And Jesus has made us alive in order that we might live for Him. Commit our lives to Him, not just to continue in our sin. I says, is that what you want to do? Are you wanting to leave the path of sin? He said, yes. I said, then, you simply need to talk to God. We call it prayer. Talk to God and tell Him what it is that your sins are. Tell him that you trust him. Commit your life to him. He says, okay, Ken, Ken, but I've never done this before. I want to make sure I get it right. Will you pray with me? And so we prayed together. And he would count that day as the day that God brought him to himself, the day in which he entered the kingdom of God. Now, We don't all have that. I don't remember the day when that happened to me. It was gradual. It was little by little. The point I'm getting at is God is the one who produces this in our own lives. And that leads us to the the second point here. Actually, I wanted to bring, uh, touch it on to your life. 
Just before the session, right, what did Danny say? Once again, Asbury College has said, you are the best large group that they have ever had. When we were at the Ark on Wednesday, I overheard, actually in a conversation with uh, one of the staff members, they, they said, this is such a wonderful group. How many of there are you? And we got to explain a little bit what we were doing. They said, the kids are so well behaved. I said to one, I said, well, we drugged them before we sent them here. <laughs> I said, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now, when you hear that, when you hear that, I want you to see, young people, I want you to see that this isn't just because you happen to learn good manners when you were kids and you happen to carry it over. Now, to a certain degree, for some of you, maybe that's the case. But what I want you to see in that is to say, praise God, God has done something in your life. How is it that a group this size can have that kind of a reputation? I don't believe it can happen without the grace of God doing something and working inside of us. Do you see the power of God at work in you? Recognize God's grace in what seems to be ordinary, and when you do, give thanks to Him. So we've looked at your power for good works. I want to go on now to look at your purpose for good works or the purpose of good works. I think it was yesterday Pastor Sean had asked the question, why are we saved? For what purpose? To what end? And he began to answer that, but now in verse 7, we come to another um, explanation of that. And it goes like, uh, let me read the background here. In Ephesians chapter uh, 2, Actually, let me just stick with this text right here and then we'll go on to another one. Notice this. So that in the coming ages he might show, and I've underlined show because that's the word I want to emphasize and highlight. He might show what? The immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So how is it that God uh, shows this? In other words, how does he display it? How does he demonstrate his grace? How does he model that grace? How does he make his grace known? Notice he says, I'm going to do this in you. And he's speaking, first of all, to the Ephesian church. So I've asked myself, how is it that God is going to show that grace? And if you read ahead to chapter 3, which I'd like you to do, if you're in your Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. where the Apostle Paul gives a little back uh, backstory to his ministry and to how it is that the gospel came to Ephesus. And he says in verse 7, of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. In other words, he says, it is a gift of God that I was even brought to you to preach this. When you come to worship on Sunday mornings, how many of you, when you see your preacher standing in the pulpit, say, that is God's gift to our congregation? And I know if you know your pastor at all, you know that he's ordinary in most ways. And you know that he's just like you. But do you realize that God has raised up a man who has been trained in the Word of God so that he can teach you and to say, there's a gift of God. Those are the means by which God brings about faith in my life. But then he says this. In the second part of verse 7, he says, which was given me by the working of his power... And now this isn't the working of his power by which Paul was saved, but he says, to me... Though I am the very least of all the saints, and I don't think he's just being modest, he remembers the days when he persecuted the church. He remembers the days when he hated Jesus Christ. He remembers the days when he was so zealous to put Jesus down that he was an enemy of the cross. 
He says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace, that is this gift of preaching was given to do what? To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Now, when he talks about the, the mystery that was hidden for ages, he said, way, way back in the Old Testament, in those days, what I'm about to tell you was hidden. It had not yet been revealed. But now the time has come. Jesus Christ has come into the world, and now I'm going to tell you about his resurrection from the dead. I'm going to tell you how he ascended into heaven, and now I'm going to tell you the power that is at work in you. But then he goes on to say this in the next verse. Look at verse 10 with me. For what reason? So that, and I've left out a little word here, so look at the screen, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. And the question is, to whom is this going to be made known? Look at this. To the rulers and authorities. And where are these rulers and where are these authorities? Look at the next line. In the heavenly places. In other words, he's not talking about the President of the United States. He's not talking about the Prime Minister of Canada. He's talking about those who have powers and authorities in the heavenly places and we call them angels and demons. He says, I am preaching this to you, Ephesian Christians, so that God might make known and show the immeasurable riches of his grace even to the rulers and the powers in heavenly places, including angels and demons. Now, how is God going to show and advertise his wisdom? How is he going to make this known to the demons and to the angels? Get ready. Here's a shocking surprise. Watch now as we fill in the top line here. Through the church. Through the church. That's how God makes his wisdom known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Angels and demons watch the church to know what God is up to. Isn't that interesting? Remember yesterday, or Wednesday, I told you the story of Walker Montgomery. I can only imagine the emotional turmoil that he went through that night. And as I think of this particular verse, and what the Apostle Paul is saying back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, what a difference this would have made in the life of Walker at the moment of temptation. He thought he was all alone in his bedroom scrolling Instagram, but what if at that moment he had remembered angels and demons are watching me to see what the grace of God does in my life. The demons on the one hand hoping that this will be the fall because what does it say about Satan in John 10.10, 10, he's like a thief who only comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And what if on the other hand he said, but the angels are watching and I want to, I want to be a testimony and a witness to the angels. Perhaps that would have kept him from proceeding with this flirtatious conversation. But I want to focus on what difference this makes for the Walker Montgomerys in the church today. Not, so, not simply in the moment of temptation, but what happens when you fail? What happens when you fall? Because I wonder how many young people here today have a shameful secret that's weighing them down. Something that you're deeply ashamed of, maybe nobody knows, maybe only a few people know, 
but you're carrying it around and you say, what do I do with this weight on my chest? Let me tell you this. Angels and demons are wanting to see what happens. Is God's grace, or shall I put it this way, what is God's grace going to look like? And do you remember the parables in Luke chapter 15? The lost coin, the lost son, the lost sheep. And do you remember what happens to angels when sinners repent? There is more rejoicing in heaven when a sinner repents and turns from his sin. Oh, what an opportunity it would have been for for Walker to say, Oh, so shameful, so embarrassing, I just want to kill myself. But then to be convinced, but wait a minute. If I turn in this moment, if I go to my parents, if I come clean, if I confess this, do I not realize that in heaven there's going to be rejoicing, there's going to be celebration because God's grace in my life has turned me back. Young people, there is no sin too shameful that God cannot forgive in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that. I don't want you to have to carry that shameful burden, but to take it to Jesus. And if you need help with that, you go to somebody that you trust and talk to them about that burden so that they can help walk you through your shameful events and receive and understand how to embrace Jesus Christ and His sacrifice in your place. So what's the purpose of good works? Well, what did it mean for the Ephesian Christians, right? They were worshipers of Artemis. Probably sexual rituals, as I mentioned the other day. They were involved in black magic, tapping into demonic powers. Angels and demons were observing what happened in Ephesus, and they saw the gospel come to Ephesus. And now, thinking back to verse 7, what did it say? It said, so that he might, so that in the coming ages, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. When are those coming ages? Well, one interpretation or one one way to look at it would be is when Jesus Christ comes again and when we stand in glory, yes, then we see something of the immeasurable riches of God's grace. But I suspect that there was another dimension involved and that is that when, when God converted the Ephesian Christians... When God had Paul pen this letter to the Ephesians, I suspect, in fact, I'm actually convinced that God had RYS 2023 in mind. Here we are, 2000, almost 2,000 years after the time that the Apostle Paul would have ministered in Ephesus, about 2,000 years after he had written this letter to the Ephesian Christians. And now what is he saying? You Ephesian Christians, I'm going to put you on display in 2023 for a group of young people gathered at Asbury College, and I'm going to show something of my grace by telling your story. And then when we apply it to your lives, do you see what the purpose of God's power is in your life? It is so that you would be a witness, as we've already indicated, so that people can see what happens when the grace of God begins to transform lives of individuals. Amazing, amazing. That leads us to the last detail your pattern for good works. And here we come to verse 10. Verse 10. Notice this. For we are His workmanship. 
Notice that. It's not we will become his workmanship. It's not that we were his workmanship. It says that we are. I remember years ago seeing a little kid wearing a t-shirt that says, God doesn't make junk. God has made you to be a new creation. If you go on in verse 7, it says, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the language of Genesis. Where there was no life, now there is life. Where there was no earth, now there is an earth. Where there was no heaven, now there is a heaven. And now we come to to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He says, there was a time when there was no life here, no spiritual life. There was no church in Ephesus. There were were no worshipers. But now there are worshipers. Where did that come from? It was from God who prepared you and created you in Christ Jesus for good works. And then notice the last thing, that we should walk in them. Well, this sets us up for the rest of the book of Ephesians. Turn with me in your Bibles. I want you to notice how that word walk is picked up throughout the rest of this letter. Pastor Sean had picked up on this as well, saying if you don't get these first three chapters straight then the rest of Ephesians is going to be like a checklist. It's going to be like a duty list. And you're either going to feel self-righteous because you're doing pretty good or you're going to despair because you haven't done very well. So notice this. When you come to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What is that calling? I'm a child of God. That's uh, what you've been called to. He goes on in verse 2 to say this. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Look at verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what our walk ought to look like. Those are the good works for which God has prepared you. But then turn with me to chapter 4, verse 17. You find the word walk again. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Right? What is God? When he made us alive, he did something to our minds. He changed the way that we think. He changed what we feel so that we begin to operate differently. And then look at, drop down to verse 22. What does it mean to walk not like the Gentiles? Verse 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Look down at verse 24, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It's this habit, it's this pattern you see of putting off and putting on. Put off the old, put on the new. Always replace the sinful habit, the sinful pattern of thinking with the godly pattern of living and thinking. And then go down to chapter 5 verse 2. Chapter 5 begins, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. And what does that look like? Well, this section ends, verse 21, by submitting to one another. And then it goes on in chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 22 to, 20 to 33, about husbands and wives, how to submit to one another in marriage. Then we come to chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. What does that submission look like? Young people, I know, we're at the end of the week. You're tired. But when you get home, when you walk through the door of your house, I want you to remember this. As you walk through the door, I want you to say to yourself, I'm coming back home as a child of God. And I'm going to function in my family as a child of God. 
to live in love with my siblings, to live in respect for my parents. Why? Because these are the good works that God has created for me to do. And then begin to think beyond that to the church. Your church family. How can I serve in the church family? And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a, a Sunday school teacher or necessarily, right? It begins with being faithful with what God has given you to do, being present in worship, not just being there, but being engaged. And let me say to you, young people, how important you are to the body of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, girls. The 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old girls are looking to see what style of shoes you wear. They're looking at the clothes that you choose to wear, and I can guarantee you this. They're not looking at the pastor's shoes wondering, hmm, I think I'd like to wear the same kind of shoes the pastor wears. Do you realize that because you are the next step ahead of, a, ahead of them in life, they're looking to you to see what does that next step look like? Not only how do you dress, but also how is it that you behave yourselves? So that if you fellas are going out of the church parking lot, squealing the tires of your pickup truck, you know what the 12-year-old boys are thinking? That's what you do when you get to be 16. You get yourself a pickup truck and you drive it to church and you squeal out of the parking lot as loud as you can. But what if they noticed that you were somebody who actually knew the names of the 12-year-old kids in your church and he says, wow, that senior in high school, he knows my name. Do you see what you've just done? You've encouraged a kid who looks up to you and he sees that you're in church on Sunday morning. And you know what? He looks over you during singing time and he says, hey, that guy is actually singing. It's a cool thing to be singing. Do you begin to see how you are a part of the body of Jesus Christ and even the way that you conduct yourself on Sunday morning, Sunday evening at, at worship services has an impact on the younger kids? I remember having a conversation with uh, some young parents years ago who said, you know what? We come to the Sunday evening service and our kids are the only ones in the service. And our kids are now starting to ask us, why do we have to go to the Sunday evening service? Why do you suppose they were asking that question? Because none of the older kids were there. Do you begin to see this pattern of good works that you begin to walk in, in the little things in life and you begin to see how that has an impact on the lives and the well-being of others? Walk in good works. All right, it's time for our one final review. One final review. This is your final test. All right? You all remember who you are, odds and evens? All right, you remember who you are, odds and evens. Those of you who are the odd-numbered folks, this is what you're going to do. You're going to turn to your neighbor on the right. And you're going to say to that neighbor, in Christ, you're a child of God. On three, do it. One, two, three. And those of you who are even numbered, those of you who are even numbered, I want you to turn to the person on your left and I want you to say, in Christ, you have a glorious inheritance. On three. One, two, three. The odds. Did I get something wrong? All right, the odd-numbered folks. The odd-numbered folks, here we go. You're going to say to the person on your right, in Christ, your power can't be measured. On three, one, two, three. All right, and you even-numbered folks. You even-numbered folks. Since you did a little bit better on the pretest. 
Here's a new one, so listen carefully. You're going to turn to the folks uh, and you're going to say, in Christ, you are alive. On three, one, two, three. Okay. Here's what I want to do to close. What I want to do to close is I want to take you back. I want to take you back to Ephesus one more time. And I want you to remember that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. He wrote this letter from a prison probably chained to a prison guard. And I want you to think of yourselves as folks in the church in Ephesus. And I want you to listen to the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to you. It goes like this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called? What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. But you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result that works so that no one may boast. <laughs> For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 2, verse 10. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
we have been praying this week that you would show to us the hope that we have in Christ. I pray that each of us might go home with a greater sense of being a child of God because of being made alive by your power. May we each go home with a greater sense of the glorious inheritance that we have in Christ, which is greater than all the riches of this world because it is a relationship with you. And may it be, Heavenly Father, that we go home with a greater appreciation for the power that has been at work in us when you raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of your heavenly power. And may we begin to recognize, even in what seems to be so ordinary, common experiences in our lives, may we recognize your grace so that we might live more humbly, more thankfully, and more joyfully. Lord God, hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen.